Hello, it is so good to be with you today. I'm Chaplain Sean Lee, the Joint Force Headquarters Chaplain for the Maryland National Guard. And it is a privilege to be with you at this workshop to talk about partners in care. Now, when I address you today, I address you on behalf of 6,700 Maryland Army and Air National Guardsmen and their families. Under the leadership of Major General James Atkins, over the last about nine years, since March of 2005, you know, as chaplains were not so good with the, uh, with the mathematics side of the house, more the relational side, but for many years now, we've discovered that a missing part of the circle of support for our soldiers, our airmen, and their families, for years, the missing piece had been the role of local faith communities in their support, in that network of support. Now, for you folks at the American Association of Suicidology, um, we share your concern to try and promote a culture of health and hope and life for our soldiers and airmen, airmen and family members, and especially with the long cycle of deployment. And so we've found that Partners in Care is a program, an initiative that we began that allows us to tap into faith communities for referral support. And this accomplishes something very important. It allows us to increase capacity uh, for support in, to rural and dispersed populations. Let me give you a little background to explain that. Many people aren't aware of the difference between active component, reserve, and National Guard. All of them wear a uniform, but there are some very unique differences. When the active duty military member deploys, they deploy from a base or a post. In that defined geographic area, they can identify rather quickly where the support is. Uh, mental health may be two blocks down and on the right. Chaplain's office, well, that's three blocks the other way and on the left. Uh, for the Army, Army Emergency Relief, easy enough to find. Also, the families that remain behind during deployment usually live in close proximity to other families that understand the stress and strain that deployment puts on a family as well as on the military member. Well, the National Guard and the Reserve are different. National Guard and Reserve members live in the communities across the states where they're located. Often, the support systems that are available during deployment it might take several hours uh, to, to drive and to access that support, or it may be non-existent depending on the state or the territory where they're located. Now, while the military members deployed, all of the support is available to them. Indeed, as a chaplain, uh, we're there located with all of the different uh, types of military, Army, Air Force, uh, Navy, Marines, Coast Guard, and that support remains available there. Many times we are a gatekeeper. Uh, often the unit will say if an individual has problems, well, go talk to the chaplain. And when they do, uh, we're respectful of their faith and how that might inform their thought processes, but we also know how to refer them to the support that's there while they're on active duty. But as soon as a guardsman comes back from mobilization, returns to the United States, and they leave what we call a demob site, that's the base or the post where they go for a period of time, to process back to the United States, once they leave there and get home, they're no longer eligible for those support systems that were there when they were on active duty. And so the challenges become unique. Now, frame this in the larger context of the historic occasion where we find ourselves. The United States has been at war longer now than at any other period in U.S. history. About two years ago, it passed the Vietnam War as the longest continuous conflict in U.S. history. It's the longest conflict with an all-volunteer force since the American Revolution. And it's the first war in U.S. history where once you deployed and came home, you have to go back again. So go back to September 11, 2001, and realize that many of the soldiers, the military members that we have in our force today, that have enlisted, at that time they were eight, nine, ten years old. For the National Guard, we were never designed to be an operational force, but that's exactly what we've become. Now what that means is, they used to think, well, the National Guard is there if there's a snowstorm and uh, the governor needs some help. Well, that's true. And as a caveat, you may not realize that the National Guard is unique in that the governor cannot call up the active duty or the reserve military members within the state. 
But because the Constitution, the governor, she or he can call up the National Guard. So along with repeated deployments to combat operations, for many of our guardsmen, they've had at least two, maybe more deployments. Since September 11, 2001, we've also had multiple deployments for state and national, or what we call domestic operations, uh, or defense support to civil authority missions. For instance, Hurricane Katrina, the uh, fire at the Gulf uh, oil rig, uh, the Southwest border mission. Uh, here in Maryland, we had what we called snow, uh, Snowmageddon. We had two blizzards in about uh, 10 days or less. Well, when you think of the resiliency of the human spirit, it's become very strained. And relationships among family members and loved ones has become significantly strained. So in 2005, the Adjutant General had come to me and said, Sean, come here, I want to talk to you. And I said, okay, sir. Which is what you say when the two-star general wants to talk to you. And uh, he said, and the Adjutant General at that time was a uh, Air Force uh, fighter pilot. He said, when I deployed, the first place that my wife turned was to our local congregation. He said, but I've reviewed the list of supports that we have available, and no one mentions the local church. He said, how is it we've ended up with a godless program? Well, his question took me back a little bit, but uh, keeping a, a straight face, I said, sir, could you explain that to me a little more? He said, yes. He said, I want you to make sure that if our soldiers, our airmen, or their family members would like to turn to a local congregation as part of the circle of support, that they're able to do that. Can you do that, chaplain? And I said, yes, sir, because that's also the only answer you can give to the two-star uh, general. And when I left, I began to think about this, and as chaplains are wont to do, I began to pray about it and wonder how could we connect with the local faith communities for support. We had had some that had come to us uh, wanting to help and not knowing about separation of church and state and the associated fears. We told them uh, kindly but gently, thank you for your offer, but we really can't accept it. Just keep us in your prayers. Well, after talking with the general, I went and spoke with our legal folks. We call them JAGs, Judge Advocate Generals. They're excellent lawyers because they all practice civilian law as well as military law. Remember, in the Guard and Reserve context, we don't do this full time. Uh, we do the one weekend a month, the two weeks in the summer. And the joke now is rather cynically, that's how often we get to be home, but we don't do this full time. And uh, I went to our JAGs, our lawyers, and, and talked to them and said, how can we access the faith communities? We need to do it in a way that there's no money involved and that doesn't imply our endorsement of any particular religious group. And so uh, the JAGs talked with me and they met uh, for about uh, three weeks and then a miracle happened and this is chaplain speak, and the miracle is that they came up with a memorandum of understanding. Now, it's not so much that they produced the document. The miracle is it was less than two pages in length. And, uh, and, and the MOU, the Memorandum of Understanding, says that if we sign on a local congregation or faith-based organization as a partner in care, which is what we call this program, because we are partners in caring for our soldiers and airmen and family members, this congregation, this faith-based group, has agreed that they'll provide support free of charge, regardless of religious affiliation, and with no further obligation on the Guard member's part. When we sign the document, and I sign on behalf of the Adjutant General, it says clearly that when we refer a Guardsman to that local congregation, it's not our endorsement of that particular religious group, Rather, it's our recognition of a local faith-based community resource. You see, the original social service agency was not a government program, however wonderfully uh, uh, effective they are. The original social service agency was the local congregation that has and always will be in every community, usually made up of community folks who care about their neighbors. And a technical term here, by golly, that's where the National Guard and the Reserve live, in the local communities. We always have. So we started with four congregations in March of 2005. I have not gone out to enlist a single congregation or faith-based organization, but I can tell you as of today, in April 2013, we have 92 partner-in-care congregations 
They're located in all the counties of Maryland, all 23 counties, and Baltimore City. Last year, 2012, we use a calendar year, uh, we had 138 referrals to Partners in Care congregations. Of those, 47% had never been deployed yet. Of the ones that we referred, all but 16 are what we call junior enlisted uh, military members. That means they're in the rank of, of, of private to sergeant. They're younger. And the leading presenting issue for referral was groceries. But we find that behind that there are other issues as well. We have folks who are lacking some basic life skills that used to be perhaps presumed, uh, presumed but are now not given uh, as far as financial management, conflict resolution, um, how to set goals, how to find your own sense of core and value. Well, the congregations each agree to provide support within the limits of their ability. Now, some congregations are small, some are larger, some do more, some do less. Based on what they can, though, they all offer their support free of charge, regardless of religious affiliation, with no further obligation on the Guard member's part. I can share with you that in the Maryland National Guard, we have had several suicides during this current conflict. But I can share with you that not a single one of the people or soldiers, airmen or family members, not a single referral that we've made to Partners in Care has been one of those folks who've chosen to take their life. I'm glad to be able to say that. How does the program work? Well, the congregation will provide us with a point of contact. And this is a dedicated person who can be reached 24-7 and uh, when a soldier comes in, suppose there's Private Smith who comes in and talks with us. And in the process of looking at what resources might be available, we'll describe everything that's there. You know, Eileen Zeller has been instrumental in, in uh, translating the value of Partners in Care to SAMHSA. They'll be sharing more with you about that in this workshop. But uh, they'll provide us with a point of contact, the congregation will, and uh, when the soldier comes in, we'll talk to Private Smith and we'll ask uh, if he has, or he or she, when we talk about the support systems, it may be SAMHSA, it may be the VA, it may be Military One Source, it may be the Family Assistance Program. We'll also ask, do you have a congregation that you're part of? If they say yes, then we encourage them as part of the resources to consider reaching out to as their own congregation. We don't mention Partners in Care after that. But if they say no, or they're part of the great American company of used-to-be's, well, then we'll share with them about partners in care and ask them if they're interested. If they say yes, while they are present with us, we will call the point of contact from that congregation. Let them know about the individual and their needs, and let them know we're going to give that soldier, that airman, that family member, the name and number of the point of contact for the geographically closest available partner and care participant. I hang up the phone, I give the name and number to the individual, and then they decide if they want to indeed follow up with a phone call. A few weeks later, we'll usually come back and ask if a contact was made, just so we can follow up. Uh, we track each referral. We try and capture data, whether the person's been deployed or how often they've been deployed, what the issues are, so we can track trends. Partners in care. Again, the original social service agency, the local congregation. Today we have 92 congregations and faith-based organizations. When I say faith-based organizations, we have three Knights of Columbus groups that have signed up. Uh, we also have a United Methodist Women's Group. We even have a Christian Motorcycle Group. <laughs> but among the congregations, any and every congregation is welcome to participate. We have Unitarian, Catholic, Orthodox, Jewish congregations. Uh, Ukrainian Orthodox and uh, the assorted variety of Protestants, some large Catholic congregations. Any faith-based organization or congregation is welcome to participate. We feel like building community is one of the key things to do in trying to intervene prior to a suicide attempt. Helping folks find hope, to feel that connection with a local community that cares. Many of the congregations, their point of contact is a veteran who is a member of the congregation. And that veteran has an ability to resonate with the soldier, the airman, the family member, because they've been there. And they're able to, uh, because of that, build some usually uh, quick rapport and perhaps even trust. Many times 
the soldier or airman will unpack their story further and other resources and wonderful things begin to happen. Uh, we've sent people for groceries and they've ended up finding better jobs. Uh, last year alone, we had six of our folks who were homeless and we were able to help them get into an apartment. We provided support systems and networks to help folks get transportation to doctor's visits, after school care, housing maintenance, yard work while the soldier airmen's deployed. There's a, a, an untold and untapped wealth of goodwill for the military across our nation. And here in Maryland, Partners in Care, we're proud of it. It's one of the few original ideas we've had, but we've been willing to share it. Today it's in, at my last count, 18 states, and it's being started up in five additional ones. Now, in just a few minutes, uh, I'm sure Eileen and the others are going to unpack with you the tremendous success that SAMHSA had in helping five states begin to start a Partners in Care program in their state. It's adaptable to different circumstances and situations. It won't look exactly the same in every state. But for certainly, it's one more piece of the circle of support that can be there for our military members and their families. Thank you for this opportunity to address you. I'm sure Eileen will share with you my contact information, but if you have a pen and pencil hand, or a pen and paper handy, I'll even give you my cell phone number. Now, for all of you out there wondering about healthy boundaries, relax, I trust you folks with this. But my cell phone number is 443-992-5395. And I'd be glad to talk with you further if you have any questions. Again, thank you for your work, it's so important. Thank you for your time and uh, letting me uh, talk with you about Partners in Care today.